Thank you so much, uh, Alison, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I am founder of Cosmica. I am also director of the 1000 Immunomes Project at Stanford University. I've been with them for 17 years now, and also associate professor and director of the AI platform at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging in Marin County. Uh, my interest in space research started in the middle of the pandemic when uh, Susie Sanella reached out to me to say, David, your research in the immunome and how that applies to aging is very applicable to what we're trying to do in terms of trying to develop countermeasures for the risks associated with space, space flight. And that caught my attention immediately. We became good friends. We had NASA grants together. Um, she actually uh, invited me to be part of uh, a consortia there. And uh, she passed away in December of uh, 2023 from a pancreatic cancer, a very, very uh, sad story. But she was focused on accelerated aging and the risks associated with space flight. And much of what we were discussing were uh, things around how space has impacted our day-to-day -day lives from uh, solar panels to Velcro to baby formula, et cetera, all these different industries, information technology, our cell phones, right, satellites, uh, to all the way to health and medicine. And that's exactly what we're doing at Cosmica. Um, many of you may know, some of you may not know, but spaceflight accelerates physiological aging. Uh, astronauts suffer from uh, uh, cardiovascular disease uh, five times increase during the life course of, of their, of their uh, life. There's uh, decreased cognitive function. There's reactivation of viruses, things like cytomegalovirus or things that we all have but are latent. In astronauts, they reactivate. There's immunosenescence that are very similar to what you see during aging, but that happens at an accelerated pace. And we have demonstrated ourselves, um, but also research from JAXA 6, NASA, and the European Space Agency that um, low gravitational forces accelerate also molecular and biological aging in different forms. So these are the different um, uh, hallmarks of aging, and they get accelerated. So I will claim that this is the first non-disease model for accelerated aging, and we're pivoting on this. Everybody ages differently, and these are the hallmarks of aging I just showed you. So I may age through inflammation, someone else may age through senescence or telomere attrition, etc. So it's very difficult to note uh, how the mechanism of aging will affect that individual in the future. Um, and this is probably more important than, than, than this previous concept, and that is that trajectories matter. So we build a clock, this is in collaboration with Mark Davis at Stanford, uh, yet another clock of aging. Uh, based on immunoproteins, uh, and you can see that these individuals that deviate from the, from the average may be at risk right, to develop some disease. So this is the IPACE, this is immunoproteomic um, uh, clock of aging, and calendar uh, aging on the um, x-axis. Now if you look closely, longitudinal data, that individual that, you seem to be, that seemed to be at risk actually had a very stable trajectory and didn't develop any diseases. This individual that was at the very bottom, who seemed to be protected, uh, had this accelerated aging and developed cardiovascular disease. So trajectories matter, and more importantly, looking at the future is, is very important in the case of predicting diseases. So what if we could uh, predict the root causes of the future aging? We could potentially um, fight it. That's exactly what we're doing in a lab on Earth. We're simulating microgravity using two different instruments, the uh, rotating wall vessel in the right-hand side of the slide. This is developed by NASA engineers. Basically what happens is you keep the cells and organoids in free fall, in constant weightlessness, and that accelerates aging by, by five, about five to 10 years, depending on the organoid or type of cell that you use. Blood, around five years. Cardiac organoids, also five years. Uh, uh, neural organoids seem to be much more sensitive, and you can accelerate up to 10 years uh, physiological aging in those organoids. So we're pivoting um, on this technology, and we can also use the random position machine that's shown in the left-hand side that was developed by your European Space Agency to simulate microgravity and do high-throughput screening of different compounds to reverse those aging processes from happening. So basically, we have four steps here. First of all, we collect blood from individuals. 
Second, we age those cells um, by about five years in 25 hours simulated microgravity. Three, we compare the data before and after. And four, we develop different individual personalized aging um, uh, solutions. So this is what we have in the company. And this is how the report will look like. In the left-hand side, you see how fast that person will age in the next five years. So in this example, this individual will age 6.3 years or biological age years in, year, in five years. So we have a 25% acceleration of, of, of aging. And then which, uh, most importantly, which mechanisms will affect that individual? Just as I mentioned before, that individual will be affected mostly by inflammation and senescence, not so much by mitochondrial dysfunction. We also have the opportunity to do disease risk assessment and the top compounds that um, we pull from different AI machine learning tools using whole uh, genome transcriptomics and mapping things with um, around uh, 150,000 compounds from the, from the public domain. Now we test these things. We take the compounds and we test them in your age cells to see which ones will work. Um, so this will be offered through, yes, please. One minute. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost there. Um, so this will be offered through longevity clinics, concierge medicine doctors, uh, elite healthcare physicians in three different buckets. The tier one I mentioned, oh, why is it not there? Oh, yeah, right here. So tier one will be the blood aging assessment, as I mentioned before, about five years of uh, biological aging. Second tier will be um, the blood aging plus the screening of the compounds that are likely to work. And then we develop uh, the tier three, which is my favorite, the older twin. Today, we can take cells from an individual and de-differentiate them immediately into cardiac organoids, neural organoids, skin organoids, muscle organoids, and create a whole body, if you will, in a dish, which is gonna be your older twin. And we can take the same approach as before, but here with uh, a number of different organs uh, to see which mechanisms of aging will affect those organs and which compounds can be used to stop that aging process from happening. You met me, Scott Guinebo is around here. If you wanna uh, talk to him, he's the CEO of the company. He comes from the Broad Institute, Harvard. Um, Michael uh, is the head of R&D, and we have a very good scientific advisory board, clinical advisor and business advisor. I'm very lucky to have uh, Alison uh, be part of this team. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, this will be, yeah, thank you, there you go. <laughs> we have time for a question. Okay. Uh, so, uh, is the reverse true? So, is in, in high gravity, does aging slow? Can you repeat the question? Uh, does in high gravity does aging slow? Is is the reverse true? Um, we haven't tested that, but the theory tells us no. High gravity will also cause accelerated aging. There is a um, there's a sweet spot, right? We where we evolve in one G. Mm. Uh, anything that you do to the cell to alter the mechanical transduction mechanisms will cause uh, remodeling of the cytoskeleton, falling apart mitochondria, inflammation, fibrotic response, very similar to what you see in aging. And other one quick, other one quick question also. Uh, so for the accelerated aging that astronauts have, uh, did that take into account confounding factors like the stress of becoming an astronaut or other things like that? Uh, those studies are, are, are uh, complicated, to put it that way, because uh, controls are all, always the, the, the issue. Sample size is always an issue as well. And so that comes from epidemiological data, but there's not much out there. So that's a great question. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, David. Yeah, thank Wonderful. you.